Hey guys, welcome back to season three of A Catholic's Perspective, the podcast all about being a young Catholic surviving in a secular world. Today I have a special guest with me. My special guest is specifically, I think you're mainly on YouTube, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So today, this is going to be really fun. We have John Doyle with us to discuss politics and our own Catholic experience in politics. So why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners, John? Hello, listeners. My name is John Doyle. I do political commentary primarily on YouTube. I work with other companies in like uh, online right wing media, and I try to provide when I can my own Catholic perspective on the political dynamic. That's perfect. It's perfect for this podcast, because I think especially with how the elections went in 2016, and then now in 20, I think it was in 2020, how they went, like just seeing the dynamic of how much things have changed in politics over the years. It's really important for us as Catholics to really take up space in the public um, area and in politics. I mean, we have a great example of Amy, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, you know, but Outside of that, you don't see too many great examples of Catholic leadership in um, in politics because Biden definitely doesn't give the best Catholic approach to, to things. Um, so I guess first off, just kind of jumping into things, first and foremost, what are politics? Um, I guess in, in the simplest terms, politics is just an understanding of how things ought to be. Um, I mean, anything by definition, if you make a declaration on to how things should be, that is like a political statement because it's just defined, I guess, by people and how our institutions are formed around people to serve their needs, uh, hopefully in ways that are good. But that's interesting because a lot of times you hear in our, you know, claimingly uh, secular culture that, oh, well, this shouldn't be a political issue and this shouldn't be politicized. Everything is a political issue. Like by definition, if you are going to declare that there is a thing and it should be more like this, that is political. And so there are people people who are going to be near the levers of power that could make that possible. And so we have an obligation, I believe, to uh, be as close to those levers as possible, if not controlling them in the first place, because otherwise bad people are going to do it and they don't do very good when they're in those positions. No, I think we already got proof of that over the last few years of how we've seen things be handled in our, you know, state. And I mean, I live in a very, um, I live in a very blue state in the state of Illinois. And so abortion is through the roof. We're known as like a safe haven for abortion people who want to get abortions. Um, Our governor and our mayor are very keen on making sure that underage kids can go and get abortions without their parents ever knowing that, um, what is it? Birth control can be delivered right at your doorstep. Like it's absolutely insane, but, um, Yeah, we do have a duty as Catholics to be in the political system. And if something is political, we have a right to say, okay, is this right or is this wrong? And then vote on that. So how were you introduced into politics? I I don't know. I wish I had like some moment where I knew like this is what, but it was more just like an interest of mine that's uh, after I graduated high school, I decided to sort of throw my hat in the ring and it took off from there. Uh, I guess my earliest political memory was probably like during the George Bush election in 2004. I remember driving around and like booing the John Kerry yard signs and like cheering on the George Bush yard signs. Or I think really though, the moment that like radicalized me, so to speak, was when they had that thing, I don't know if you remember this at Yale in like 2014 or 2015, where they were screaming about Halloween costumes. Mm. I remember just being very off put by that behavior. And then uh, from there, I kind of wanted to, I guess, follow it on a more day to day basis. But even, you know, there was a lot of the um, abortion rhetoric back then too, in the Obama years, I remember like seeing cousins of mine share things like that. And I wanted to start arguments with them. Um, because they were very liberal. And I was like instinctively pro-life because I was raised in a Catholic household, but I really wasn't that educated on it, which is actually kind of better in a way, because the more you learn about things, the more like it just like weighs down on your shoulder. It's almost better to just have that like instinctive, just like, no, I'm not going to debate whether or not it's okay to kill babies. You're just wrong. So... Yeah, no, I I know what you mean. It can be a really heavy topic. And I know you're on YouTube and you're on a bunch of places. Did you start doing in-person talks recently or is that something you've kind of been doing your entire time? I think the first one was, well, actually, you know, since we're on this podcast and (laughs) we we are called to be truthful, uh, I'll I'll open up a little bit here with a story. This is, I don't think ever been told before, but the first speech I gave was on Valentine's day. And it was called something like uh, love isn't love, how progressives are ruining 
uh, relationships through, you know, hookup culture. Set. And I gave it on um, the college campus. I think it was the University of Michigan. And I wanted to give a speech. And so I rented out the room by myself and I advertised, I put posters up and everything. I wasn't very big at the time. I only had, I think, a few thousand subscribers that had just started kind of taking off. So I was advertising it. I really wanted everyone to show up. And uh, I wrote out this big speech and everything. I got dressed up and, and no one showed up. There was zero. The only people who showed up were the police officers who were in charge of like maintaining security. So that was like a very humbling moment. That was also like, you know, sort of the beginning of like my villain arc. And I was like, I was like, this will never happen again. Every time I do a speech from now on, I will have audience members. So that was probably very good for me. Um, but yeah, from, from then on, I think the next fall I had did uh, a campus tour. And so I'll do them periodically throughout the year. And then I'll try to do like at least one formal tour, so to speak, during like either the fall or spring semesters. But that's always kind of the goal because there's a very rich tradition in this country and in the West, broadly speaking, of like, you know, the political activism on the campus, the college speeches, the collegiate debates, things like that. And that I am able to participate that even in a limit in participate in that even in a limited capacity is very uh, meaningful to me. So I enjoy that a lot. No, that's awesome. I think you just had a talk or you do have a talk coming up like at a college campus, right? Yeah, that was uh, two nights ago at Notre Dame, which a wonderful campus, beautiful campus, um, of course wonderful Catholic school. Uh, the professors I've heard are not doing so well at enforcing that. But yeah, I gave a talk on broadly speaking, like gay and transgender people, because I don't know if you're familiar with this trend, but a lot of times it's very popular in like right-wing media for people. And I think Ben Shapiro is the one who started this for people to cite that, you know, transgenderism is a mental illness because it says in the DSM that it is, you know, gender dysphoria or then rebranded to gender identity disorder is a mental disorder. And they like to bring this up to sort of, in most cases, I think like maliciously harass transgender people, which I think is wrong, but right. there is a very interesting, um, I guess, sort of psychological literature to look into as to what causes that. But what they don't like to talk about is that in the DSM-2, uh, up until 1973, homosexuality was also listed as a pathology. And when that was removed, it wasn't because it was disproven. It was because there was a group of scientists or psychologists who called themselves the gay PA, and they infiltrated the American Psychiatric Institution. And they were lobbying to try to get homosexuality taken out of the DSM because they knew that if they wanted to normalize it throughout American society, they're going to need that taken out. Otherwise, people are going to be like, this is crazy. So they submitted a study that basically had a group of 30 straight people and a group of 30 gay people. And each of them interpreted various pieces of artwork and like ink blots, like Rorschach tests. And then they had an independent group evaluate all of the individual interpretations of these different illustrations. And then the independent group couldn't tell the difference between a, so, uh, so to speak, gay interpretation and a straight interpretation. Therefore, this must be totally the same. And so that's why it was taken out, like for political reasons. They even brag about this. NPR, which is funded with our tax dollars, did a piece a while ago called the 81 words because it were it was 81 words that were written that actually took it out from being classified as that and so I talked about that not again to you know belittle people and make them feel like there's something wrong with them but because if you look at the way our family structure is in this country you have very androgynous roles you have men who aren't acting like men women who aren't acting like women and if you look at what actually like causes homosexuality it is basically an artificial disruption in a young boy or a young girl's natural development into either their uh, masculine or feminine identity and it can be disrupted through various things whether it's molestation which unfortunately happens in a lot of cases some various types of other trauma um, even hormones in, in their food or in their water or in their uh, formula so things like that and i just think that's important to speak about because you know there is no group in this country has a higher rate of mental illness per capita than LGBT people. And they'll say that's because people like me are mean, but that's not actually the case. It's because properly understood, that whole identity is basically an antisocial trauma response because of whatever has happened in their youth, which is very tragic. And we're not going to solve the problem by pretending that that's not the case. So that's what I tried to speak about the other night, basically. Wow, that's amazing. And I never even knew about most of that, which is fantastic, because I do think it's wrong to bully these people, because in reality, they are suffering in a lot of ways. I don't agree with all these drag shows and all these media things we're constantly seeing where people of that um, organization group do tend to target kids like there is a group of them like that but I don't think that's all of them I think there truly are some people out there who are struggling and they do need help with that. Um, and so it's just interesting to know about it because I think a lot of days, if a lot of the time, if you're on social media, you know, 
there's always a side trying to push an opinion or, or something. And rarely do people ever go and do their own research because they're just okay with whatever somebody else has told them. But it's Mm -hmm. people like you who actually do your research and are willing to be honest with people and be like, Hey, you know, we're just trying to do what's best for these people. It's very interesting to, to know. And I guess that kind of brings us to our next question is, is politics inherently evil or good? Like personally for me, I don't think it's really either one, Mm -hmm. um, but people tend to misunderstand what politics are. So I'd love to get your take on that. I think that it depends on who's, uh, who's got the power. You know, there's a very unfortunate tendency on the right, which I have tried to combat successfully to a small degree, which is this sort of tendency to view all of politics and all of power in itself as bad because we sort of embrace this like more libertarian ethos, which focuses on prioritizing freedom above all else, um, which I think is wrong because, you know, freedom is this sort of like vacuous transitory state. Like you can be free, okay, then to do what? And the way our founding fathers understood freedom was in a more pre-modern sense, um, whether it's in the Christian tradition with writers like, say, Thomas Aquinas or Dante, or even in like the more Greco-Roman tradition with uh, Plato or Aristotle, it was understood that like freedom or the way they, that they used uh, the word was um, liberty, but oftentimes those are used synonymously now. Liberty was defined as basically having total control over your more primal desires so that you were free from that vice to pursue good. And now we've sort of embraced liberty means freedom, freedom means do whatever you want, which practically defined in this country is like the freedom to pursue your preferred method of self-destruction, because the people who are now screeching the most about wanting to be free are either people on the left who want to be free to do a lot of the things that you mentioned, uh, things that are far worse than that to themselves, to others, this sort of understanding of morality that is not right and wrong, just simply based on consent. Um, And then you have people on the right who only care about freedom because they want to like buy guns and watch pornography and smoke marijuana and like all these things that are just basically not good for them. The guns, you know, that's fine, but um, it's like, you know, that really didn't help, did it? I mean, there's like so much rhetoric about the guns will keep us safe from evil. And it's like, well, that didn't really work out because people don't know God. So I think that it's good if it's used for good, which sounds simplistic, but it is true. I mean, there were a lot of very successful uh, Catholic monarchies, for example, throughout history that were only unsuccessful because they were uh, unable to basically deal with Um, I guess you'd say enemy forces who are very hostile towards them, like the French Revolution, for example. But I think if you have good people in positions of power, that is a good thing. And there is sort of this true skepticism that says, well, power corrupts, and so we need to minimize power in general. I think that is true. But also, you can solve that problem by simply like only having Christians in, in office, because you have to have somebody who really believes that they're going to be judged for what they're doing. Because if you have people who aren't authentically Christian, they don't actually believe, or they're just like openly secular or atheist and they worship Satan, they, in a long enough timeline, are going to be able to rationalize putting themselves over those who they are elected to serve and to look at, look after and protect. But if you have somebody who truly fears God, they believe and they know that they will be judged, they will bow and they will confess and they will be held accountable for what God put them in that position to do, which is good and spread his word and basically protect, I think, his children from the serpents and the vipers. And if they didn't do that and they instead exploited that power to benefit themselves and even hurt the people over whom they govern, I think that obviously they will be held accountable for that. So that's why I really don't trust people uh, to hold power if they're not Christian or in an ideal scenario, Catholic in general. No, I completely agree. And I think it's interesting because I know in politics, like a lot of people get in office because they lie, you know, I mean, that's, that's so true. And so for me, it's so hard to trust people in general because they might campaign one thing, but then as soon as they get in office, they start changing their ideals, their, yep. their views shift. And it's just scary to me that people are, I don't want to say evil because I I do think that you know, in a way there's always reconciliation given to us if we truly are sorry and repent, obviously, but, um, they just swindle people all the time. And I feel like politics has become one big, who can, who can like pull a wall over people's eyes, better kind of competition. And I mean, I'm, I haven't seen great, you know, candidates due to the fact that I think humans are imperfect, but I have seen some good ones, you know, in the past, like DeSantis is pretty cool. And then there, we have Trump, of course. And, um, but I know like, as obviously Christians, 
our Christian identity needs to come first before our political identity, right? That's kind of like what you're saying is they need to be Christian because if they're Christian, all their morals will fall in place and then they'll run the state better or the country better. So what do we do if none of the candidates align with our beliefs as Catholics? That's a very good question. Um, this is actually probably my biggest point of maybe strategic disagreement with a lot of the Christians I've spoken to. Uh, for example, there was a drag queen story hour in Dallas that I showed up to with a group of guys to protest. And I was trying to basically like humiliate the people who were bringing their children to this. And I was, you know, asking them questions like in my megaphone, like, you know, why do you want to put an ax wound in between your son's legs? Things that are, you know, maybe a little vulgar, but I wanted the footage. I wanted to humiliate them and, you know, basically shine a light on them and make them screech like vampires. And there was a Christian podcast who invited me on and then they basically like tried to confront me on it. And they were very like hostile towards me because they were wondering why I didn't just like go and read scripture to them. And I think that that is a good idea. But I also believe that there's a certain like level of demonic influence that people can be under where they're just going to double down and like continue to do terrible things, especially when met with that. So I've always looked at it from a more maybe practical um, perspective. Like, for example, you mentioned like lying to get into office. There are things that we could do, like you could run, for example, as somebody who wants to govern as a good Christian. People have tried this before, like Mike Huckabee. Unfortunately, like our country is so spiritually corroded, that person is just not going to win, whether it's because of that or whether it's because there are too many evil people who are going to prevent that from happening um, in terms of who's actually pulling the strings. But you can have people uh, like Trump or like DeSantis or like uh, um, Glenn Youngkin in, in Virginia, for example, who can run a campaign and win. And then do things that they didn't campaign on, but that are actually good for America, that are cutting off the influence of sin throughout the country. And that's really what I think the way forward is, because you have to run a campaign and focus on issues that you went on, you know, closing the border, bringing jobs back, getting us out of pointless wars. But then you can start to do things like, you know, uh, regulate pornography the same way that you regulate, you know, child pornography or something like that, or prevent, you know, Americans from... Uh, accessing TikTok, things like that, things that are designed literally by foreign entities to groom our boys into, you know, subscribing to OnlyFans, groom our daughters into making OnlyFans, things like that. And I think slowly over time, if you kind of chip away at this sort of like top down influence of sin that you see everywhere in this country, you can't even like, even now in urinals, you wouldn't know this, but in men's restrooms, you can't even go pee without seeing a screen with an advertisement promoting sports betting, drinking alcohol, you know, women in scantily clad attire, things like that. It is everywhere. And if you had a decent people sort of wielding the bureaucracy, you could actually do away with that pretty quickly. And a lot of times, well, not pretty quickly, but in a relative scale, you could eliminate it probably within a generation. And a lot of times people on my side will hear me say things like that. And they think that I'm like a tyrant who wants big government. That's actually not the case because in terms of the size of government, if you're looking at it from the perspective of purely its budget, there is so much money that is just washed away because people are, you know, dispensing patronage, they're paying their friends off, et cetera, which, you know, it's just the way politics works. But also in terms of the employees, it's kind of a backwards understanding of our situation because the reason we have so many government employees isn't because, uh, you know, they're trying to make it a good country. It's exactly the opposite. It's because they need all of these people to be in all of these places in order to run this sort of institutional mobilization to get Americans to believe things that are so fundamentally backwards. If you did not have that big of a government, things would go back to normal pretty quickly. People wouldn't believe things that are so backwards and so evil because they would still have, you know, that sense of community and they wouldn't have all these vipers whispering into their ears, telling them to hate their family, hate their friends, hate God, things like that. So in terms of like my ideal government or whatever, like it would be so much smaller because you wouldn't need it. You would just need a little bit of government to stop bad people from doing bad things, which is the whole point of it in the first place. Right. I think also term limits are so important because- I mean, the amount of people I've seen in office, they've been in office for so long. Mm -hmm. They should not be in office for that long. And that's just something that I noticed too, is I'm not super into the political side of things, just due to the fact I find it so messy. You know, there's always a fight. There's always a disagreement. There's an argument, you know, the, the traditional argument during holiday season with family. So I've always- I love that. You don't, you don't like that? <laughs> I, I, I kind of- the funny thing is, is I feel like I would enjoy it more if I actually knew what they were talking about. Yeah. That's the hardest thing. The nice thing though, is for the most part, my, most of my family agrees. And so when we get together, we're just like yelling and agreeing with each other, but mm -hmm. 
I see like all these other families that will literally disown their kids or the kids will disown their parents. And it's crazy to see conservative parents have a liberal kid and sometimes liberal liberal parents end up getting like a really conservative kid. It's very interesting how that kind of works. Um, But yeah, as time's gone on and I've kind of gotten more into politics due to the fact that it is important for us to know, I've kind of started more or less researching into the background of a lot of these people. And so why is it important for us to research into these candidates we're voting for? Um, Well, I think the first rule of like political analysis is something like follow the money. You know, you can see who's paying these people, where they come from. Typically, if they're connected to people, it's not a coincidence. Um, I mean, everybody in politics sort of behind the scenes, they all know each other. They're all friends. They all get together. And so when you can see something even as, you know, simple as one connection, whether it's they're in a photograph together or they attended the same conference or dinner, there's something to that. There's a reason that they were in the same room together. And I think that's important. And it'll kind of help you better assess their intentions because obviously everything that they say is written by consultants. It goes through the PR, the comms teams. Um, So typically it's very inauthentic. I mean, the first person to really break through that in our lifetimes was Donald Trump because he he just spoke his mind. Um, But everything else that any politician is going to tell you is always like very curated. And so it's not actually going to reflect how they're going to run in office. So it's a much better, I think, predictor, uh, predictor of how they're going to govern based on who the people they are surrounding themselves with rather than simply like what they're saying, which can also be a good thing. You know, if they're campaigning as a very like moderate person, but then they're surrounding themselves with like very like good people, very uh, maybe like, you know, radically Christian people, radically right-wing people, that's like usually a pretty good sign. So like there have even been cases where there have been like uh, Republican governors who I thought were just like totally milquetoast. And then I'll, I'll like have a dinner in DC or something and I'll meet with their advisors and I'll hear like how they actually are behind the scenes. And I'm like, okay, I want to shill for this guy because like, he's a good guy. He's doing it. He's the infiltrator. He's playing the game. So. And I think that's the hardest part too, is like knowing, you know, who, is on your side, but just trying to get in, you know, versus who is not on your side and is trying to get in because it can be really tricky. And I notice that all the time about just myself being on social media. I'm sure you've noticed this too, is that there's a persona that we put on as well. You know, we want to make sure that the content we're putting out and things match our personalities, but it's not going to be exact. When I meet people in person, they're like, oh, wow, you're so much different than I thought you were like on social media, not in a bad way, but more like authentic and genuine. Mm -hmm. Um, Because for the most part, when we're on, you know, social media or we give a talk or we do something like that, it's scripted. You know, we put it through our advisors or whatever and um, or we do it ourselves, but we still try to put out the best parts of ourselves because we think that obviously we want to show the best parts of ourselves. Um, but then when people actually get to know you a little bit more, they're like, oh, wow, this person's actually really awesome. Or in a lot of celebrity cases, wow, this person's really terrible. Yeah. (laughs) It's really interesting. That's another thing about like this whole industry too, is people get canceled and Mm -hmm. it's never actually because they said the wrong thing. That's like what triggers it. But what will actually make or break a person is how they treated people behind the scenes, because there have been people who have said things that are so outlandish that it's like, how are they still employed? But because they're actually like good people, they have had others go to bat for them, vouch for them, continue to have them on or whatever. And now, you know, a couple of years later, they recover and they're back to normal. Whereas there have been people who were huge names uh, who stepped over the line and because they're actually like terrible people, they get canceled because no one actually wants to help them out because they've treated them so poorly. Uh, you know, Miley Yiannopoulos, frankly, great example of this. You know, he comes out and he basically makes a, an apologetic case for like grooming children, gets canceled. And it's because he treats people very poorly behind the scenes. I mean, he rips them off, steals money from them, blackmails them, brags about this. And so, you know. Yikes. Wow. I also thought of like Kanye West and like all the drama going down there and there's just so much (laughs) happening. I don't know. What's your take on that drama? Do you know anything about it? The Kanye West stuff? Yeah. Well, look. I don't really have an opinion on it. I just know what I've seen and I'm like, I feel bad for people. I really do. I think that uh, he was in a position where, because look, nobody's been through a tougher time in the last few years than that guy. I mean, agreed. For for him to come out and, and really have this reconnection with God, and then to go through what he did with his wife and kind of be, you know, some of the statements he made, for example, about that are just so heartbreaking. About how like you know 
his wife is like basically a prostitute and his children will always like know that about her. And then for, you know, her to go to divorce him and he doesn't get to see his kids and he's got the whole Kardashian media team like against him. That's really tough. And then, you know, he starts doing these interviews and he's like bringing up things that you're not supposed to bring up, but he's doing it in a way where people are like, okay, that's interesting. And so if you look even a month ago, he was bringing up things about like how Jews are overrepresented in positions of power. And he's talking about that. And then people in the comments are like, oh, you know, that's really interesting. They're kind of proving his point because they're so mad about it, blah, blah, blah. And then he sort of takes it way too far. And he starts talking about how much he loves Hitler. And now like, everyone's like, okay, this guy's crazy. And so it sucks because you know, he keeps saying in these interviews, like, they'd be saying, yay is crazy. They talking like, yay is crazy. And then he's like, hi, Netanyahu. And he's like, totally lost his mind. It seems, I don't know. So I wish him the best. Uh, I, I pray for his safety and for his well-being and for uh, God to keep him safe because I think he's going to get himself into some trouble here. And I certainly don't know how that's going to affect his political campaign. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to win on that platform very easily. Yeah, no, because it's, it's interesting because the amount he did go through, I felt so bad for him. And then that whole like interview came out and I was like, a little too far there, buddy. <laughs> like, Especially too, because right now, because we are in a secular country, our equivalent of Hitler, sorry, Satan is Hitler. Like that is our secular stand in for Hitler. And right. so the same way, if we lived in like a traditionally Catholic country that was very moral, if you came out and you said, I love Satan, people are going to be like, what the heck is wrong with you? You are crazy. The same thing now with our secular stand in is Hitler. He's the worst thing ever. You know, we don't want to study him as a politician, as an interesting historical figure. He's just evil. And so now you're basically doing what people believe in their psyche to be like worshiping Satan by coming out and saying things like that. And uh, I think that that was a very poor decision on his part. But again, I mean, he must be in a very desperate situation. So I just hope that uh, he you know, comes out okay. Yeah. And it can be hard for, the, that's one thing is like, I think people forget to pray for celebrities because truly they are under a lot of diabolic influence and mm -hmm. oppression from Hollywood. And I don't even think most of them go into it thinking like, oh, you know, I'm going to be demonically oppressed or anything like that. But then after a few years in the industry, especially Disney, um, you can just see how those stars have turned out. Like very, very few of them have actually gone on to live normal lives. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting for sure. Um, but I know, so kind of coming back to our politic thing, I know you said that a smaller government would be awesome. And I completely agree with that. How can we turn our country around for the better in other ways? Like I know a smaller government would be great, but what are some other things we can implement besides small Christian government? I think that that is going to be on a more localized level. Um, I think like attending your church and being involved in it is very good. Uh, even, you know, things that, like your school board, local organizations, even I think we need more social clubs. You know, we don't really have traditional social clubs anymore. If you do, it's maybe like a country club and maybe it's too expensive or maybe like the average demographic or like older people. But, you know, I think that we need to kind of restore those traditional social components of our country um, because right now everybody is very atomized and we're connected on the internet, but that's not real. I mean, even, are you familiar with nextdoor.com? Yes, I am. I keep, fun fact, I keep getting kicked off there because I get into like, it's like, talk about big tech censorship. They keep kicking me off of next door, but I'll see things on there that are just very dystopian and disturbing to me where they're like, hello, neighbors need a good recommendation for like a sushi place or something. And people will get on there and reply. And it's like, look, you could have Googled that. What you're trying to do is like participate in this like false digital community. Do you even yeah. know the names of your actual next door neighbors? Have you even like been over there recently and hung out? And, you know, my dad used to tell this story in the early 2000s, there was a huge power outage in Southeast Michigan. And so for like two days, nobody had power in the summer and everybody was outside in their front yards. They had like a block party. They were, you know, trading, you know, lemonade for baked goods and everything. It was like a, a whole thing. And then the internet came back on, power came back on, everyone just went back inside. And for him, that was like his last taste of the America that he grew up in as a child, where there was that sense of community. And we just don't have that anymore. And that, by the way, is how you can actually like make room for that smaller government because the government didn't get bigger so it could destroy community the government actually got bigger as a result of that because i refer to this as like organic unity you know 70 years ago in this country you had things like the church the community the school the family everybody knew each other it was like a nice wholesome community and that type of community was a very high trust community they didn't have to worry about their neighbors they felt safe they felt secure 
if you erode that, people are going to feel atomized, they're going to be less trusting of their neighbors, and they're going to basically feel like they're living in some sort of disorder or chaos. That's the type of person who is going to cast a vote to basically usher in some form of bigger government to bring some sense of stability to them. That's why, you know, like you saw two summers ago, there were all those riots and people were begging for some sort of government action to be done because, you know, as society sort of reaches its cycle of decay and people don't trust each other anymore, people are more uh, uncivilized. Like the only thing that's going to keep people together is that type of government. So if we can't restore that sort of organic unity, it's only going to get worse from here in terms of like how intrusive the government is in our lives. Because if you're not unified by anything, be it religion, nation, culture, ethnicity, the only thing at that point that can unify you is like the state to which you have to pay your taxes. Uh, and that's a pretty bad scenario historically for good people. No, it's so true. I mean, I grew up in the the world that your dad kind of talked about in Michigan. And when the internet finally came out and I was raised without really the internet, we had computer games, but they weren't like internet computer games. They were the CDs that you had to put into the tower yeah. and it loaded yeah. for a while. And yeah. And so we would have to like download the games overnight because the downloading process took so long. Uh, but yeah, like that was the world I grew up in and that's a world I want my kids to grow up in. The issue is like, not everyone thinks the same thing, you know, and you don't really get to choose who your neighbors are. I mean, yeah. you can if you decide to build your own little society, but then that's kind of more cultish and I'd rather not go down that path. Um, <laughs> but I don't mind like getting a house with like my friends and stuff. And like, we have a little cul-de-sac. I think that'd be mm -hmm. cute. But it's so hard to want these things when it seems like social media is taken over. And yet, like you said, removing it, it's just like the natural community came back out almost instantly and then yeah. it switched back on and then it switched off again. It's just, it's crazy to me how that works. And um, yeah. like you were saying with the riots and stuff, it kind of ties into our next question because I only saw stuff from the media. I really didn't see anything, you know, I live in Chicago, so we're well, not in it, but you know, buy it. So you can imagine the insanity that ensued there. I never actually witnessed anything, but I heard about it on the news. But mm -hmm. how how does like the media and news manipulate the way we think when it comes to politics and, and all of these things? That is, that is a very important question. Um, if you don't mind, I kind of want to touch on one more thing on that last yeah. topic. Um, there does have to be something like you mentioned, it's not enough for you to be a good parent. There has to be other good parents. And a lot of times I hear this from people, well, you know, th those kids are going to serve as a great example to my kids for how to be normal and stuff. And it's like, you have to have like an economy of kids who are doing things outside because when I was a kid, I could ride my bike and I could see clusters of bikes at houses parked or thrown in driveways. Kids were there doing things. Kids were outside. There was like this little economy of kids outside doing stuff. Now you don't have that. I mean, I can't tell you the last time I saw that cluster of bikes. So it's not enough for there to be one kid on his bike riding around outside. If he's not interacting with other kids who are doing the same thing, he's just going to regress to the mean and he's going to go on social media, video games or whatever. Not that video games are bad, but Video games, I think now, they used to be something you would do at your friend's house with friends, but now because they're online, there's something you just do by yourself. And there is still kind of a social component there, but I think it's definitely in a uh, less advantageous form than it used to be. So I feel bad. And that's interesting too, because you can read any, like you mentioned with the social media, you can read like any poll about how people view social media and everyone agrees it's like terrible for us and it's ruining our lives, but yet we still all use it. Well, yeah. us, because we have to, I guess, maybe, yeah. maybe, that's, maybe that's an excuse, but everyone still like they almost can't control themselves enough to just put that aside for what would be objectively good. And that's kind of what I think is sad with the way that our country worships capitalism so much. It's like, we will always then sacrifice what is objectively better for our well-being at the altar of perceived convenience, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, social media or even something like blockbuster video. You know, I, uh, my sister's fiance told me a story one time about his experience at blockbuster and it like almost made me cry. You know, he was talking about, cause I love blockbuster. It's such a great time, but he was talking about how, you know, this guy who just worked at blockbuster and he would, he knew everybody there. He was able to, you know, spot you. Oh, you know, you're not going to like that. You should get this. And they would just talk about movies, talk about pop culture. And like, that was a thing that was like a staple in the community. And then people decided, well, you know, I just want to sit at home and watch Netflix. And it's like, you're not even enjoying that more. Like you could go to Blockbuster with intent to get a movie, you get the movie, it's like a whole thing. Sitting on your couch, now you're like mindlessly scrolling, looking for something to watch. You're just like this total couch potato. 
So yes, yeah, very sad. But in terms of the media and how it manipulates public perception, I mean, that's like almost what it does by definition. It, like people would like to think that it exists to inform us, but that's basically never been the case. Um, it kind of exists because the way that we've been taught to perceive tyranny is very Hollywood. There's one guy who's the evil bad guy and he controls everything. And if you're watching the media, it's got his face in the corner or something like that. The tyranny that we live under is much more ideological where just because all of these different media organizations and government institutions or you know other institutions in the country, just because they're not all under the same one party flag doesn't mean they don't all agree on what's supposed to be going on. So they have their friends in politics and vice versa. And so basically what happens is the media will, uh, I would use the term psyop, they'll run like psychological operations to emotionally manipulate people into supporting a particular point of view. And then they hold a vote on it. And then they call it legitimate. And obviously it's not. But like you mentioned with the riots too, there's a certain limitation that should exist on free speech because you had the media saying things that were demonstrably false, but that were inciting people to destroy their communities. And people were killed. Billions of dollars were done in property damage, livelihoods destroyed because the media was purposefully inciting this type of violence and chaos because they wanted to push it towards a particular narrative. And nobody's ever going to be held accountable for something like that. If I were king of America, I would put those people in jail because you just can't do that because it was wrong. Everything they were saying was wrong, whether it was in 2020. Uh, I mean, we know that George Floyd died of a drug overdose. There was nothing uh, that it showed in the autopsy that Derek Chauvin did. But now this guy's going to prison for probably the rest of his life because they literally don't have the guts to placate the masses, control their friends in the media so that one man can have justice. They're throwing him under the bus because they know that if not, the media would incite the violence again and then more uh, damage would be done. So it's a very sad situation overall. Yeah. I know Candace Owens just put that movie out about all the information on George Floyd's death and yeah. everything. And I mean, I already kind of knew that it was a drug overdose, you know, it, it was just obvious, um, because in all of the shots, like, no, his, um, his knee was not actually on his neck. If you look at the shots, it's actually on his shoulder blade. Um, there's just like so many things that didn't add up, but the media has literally lied to us and people believe the lie. They just blindly believe it without doing any of their own research. Yeah. Um, and I'm always wondering if that has something to do with like people, feeling as though they don't have a place in the world, like they need to advocate for something, they need to be a part of something, they need to support something, and they latch on to these stories that aren't truthful completely, you know, there's some truth to it, but not all truth, and they start advocating for these without, these stories without actually doing any of their own research or their own background, and, um, and then when it comes out that these stories were manipulated or twisted in some way, they were lied to, they're like, oh, well, you know, that's just how it is. Like, they try to brush the blame off instead of just being like, I should have done my own research, I should have known better than to trust the media, but unfortunately, people aren't like that anymore. Yeah, you're exactly right, because now virtue is not defined by like your piety. It's defined by how often you signal conformity with like the current thing uh, on social media. And that's why, you know, you had the black squares, you had people changing their profile pictures to like Ukrainian flags, because the media had decided this is the current moral crusade. And if you are going to be on board with it, you are good. And the more you repeat that you are on board with it, the better you are. And if you are either neutral or disagree, you're actually like a terrible person. You are literally Hitler. And that's like not only terrible for public discourse and trust. I mean, even now as an American, like you mentioned, you can't even have a family anymore because mm -hmm. the media will get inside their minds and convince them that if you disagree with whatever's going on, you are literally Hitler. And I believe that you have a right to have like your family not hate you yeah. in so far as you're not doing anything that's actually transgressive simply for believing. And, you know, if you believe something really out there, then maybe, but if you simply like disagree with the consensus of all of the people who, by the way, we know are like the worst people in the world. And mm -hmm. now you are like disinvited from Thanksgiving. I think that that's actually a violation of our, our God given rights. It is not often discussed. Um, the fact that like the media has found a way in collusion with government to deprive you of your own family in many cases, which you've seen throughout history too. I mean, you had like the Hitler youth turning against their parents in Russia, the, you know, the communists were turning children against their parents. This is a very age old tradition of the sort of tyranny that we're under, but yeah, it's not good. Well, what they like to do is they go for the kids because they do the kids. The kids are um, mollable, you know, like they're, yeah. you can mold them. And so if you go for the kids, then you're creating a generation of what 
like basically a mini army of whatever you want. And yeah. that's a whole other thing with the school systems too, like the public school systems. As soon as parents drop their kids off, it's like they lose all rights to their kids. Um, it's just absolutely insane. And so I'm just glad that we're able to come on and like talk about this stuff and bring it to the public eye, because I definitely think it's important for people to know and also for Catholics to be aware of what we're truly up against, because it's not just a physical battle. It's also a spiritual one. I don't think people like this exist without demonic influence or demonic yeah. oppression. There's no way. And it's just very sad. And so we need to remember to pray for our leaders, all of them, you know, um, whether they're in the church or in the state and definitely pray for better leaders in the future. So yeah, no, thank you so much, John, for coming on and discussing this with me. I really appreciate it. Where can my listeners find you? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, they can find me at youtube.com slash John Doyle. Um, and I think you can find me on Twitter, maybe soon at Comrade Doyle. I was kicked off a couple of years ago, but Ooh. my very good friend, Elon Musk, I think will help me out <laughs> there. So we'll see. I think I used to follow you a few years ago. And then when you got banned, I was like, what? <laughs> So and, and yet you were silent. You were silent. I know. First they came for John Doyle and I said nothing because I was not it. When they come for the religious hippie, I'm going to turn the other, I will have nothing Just be to like, do like, oh no, it. what? Yeah, who? It's okay, Sorry. we're good yet. We're good for now because like Elon Musk won't kick me off. Hopefully we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how uh, anti-Catholic he is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But yeah, no, this has been great. So thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so thank you guys for listening into this podcast. I hope that this helped maybe clarify some things about politics. And with all that being said, I'll talk to you guys in the next podcast. Bye.